Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel. Today is the start of a kind of weekly reading vlog and that is I'm reading two of my most anticipated releases of the year. I did do a whole video of my anticipated releases and two of the releases on those uh, both came out on the same day, which is today, the 2nd of March. And those are Chain of Iron by Cassandra Clare and Bridge of Souls by Victoria Schwab. I pre-ordered it. It still hasn't been dispatched. But yeah, I don't know when I'm going to actually get Chain of Iron, which is very annoying. <laughs> What's the point in pre-ordering it if I don't get it near the day of its release? Like, if it's released on the 2nd, I kind of want it on the 2nd if I pre-ordered it. And I really want to read that, like, as soon as possible because the Shadowhunter, like, fandom, they're the worst for spoilers. The absolute worst. The other release that I'm also going to be reading in this is Bridge of Souls by Victoria Schwab. Also there will be no spoilers. I might do spoilers like at the very end of the video for both of them but throughout like me just like reading them I'm not going to talk about anything spoilery. But Bridge of Souls is the last book for now in the Cassidy Blake series. She has said that she does want to revisit it at some point in the future but she does everything in kind of arcs and she likes arcs of trees so she's leaving it at this for now and so we will get some resolution at least and yeah so this is a middle grade series which follows a girl called Cassidy Blake who had a very near-death experience she almost drowned and now she can see all of the ghosts and she can kind of walk through the veil. Uh, at the end of the last book we were kind of introduced to the big bag I think maybe <laughs> and then there's also her best friend Jacob who is a ghost and her parents are also ghost hunters. They have a TV show but they actually can't see ghosts. So it's a lot of fun and I checked and Scribd have already put it up. Sometimes audiobooks don't go up for a while so I was really hoping that the audiobook would be up already and it is. I'll probably like start it today and maybe finish it tomorrow. <laughs> So, uh, and then I'll probably start in Chain of Iron. So, yeah, I think that's all for now. I'm very excited to start both of these and I hope I like them. Hi, so I'm officially like one chapter in to Bridge of Souls by Victoria Schwab and I forgot how much I love the narrator. I just, her voice is so calming and the voices she does for each character I also really love. I'm already like transported back to the story and I'm already in love and I just really love the atmosphere and the descriptions. I think this book has the best descriptions out of any V.E. Schwab book. Like she really transports you to these places and in such few words I think she really captures a load of places. Um, so yeah, and like I'm literally only like a chapter in and I already feel this way <laughs> and then also once again I forgot how much I adore Cassie and Jacob's friendship it's just absolutely adorable but I already have one negative and that is a Harry Potter reference I was really hoping she wouldn't because I know that is kind of a big part in book one and two She's like a Gryffindor and she's very proud of it. I was really hoping she would just not do them in this book, especially since, you know, JK Rowling, turf. A little disappointed about that. That's all for now. As I said, I don't have much to say yet, but I'm already really excited. It's day two of reading Bridge of Souls. I'm 50% through. I got 50% through yesterday and I'm gonna finish it today. And I don't really have too much to say. Except for it's getting dark. Even for, like for a kids book, it's creepy. <laughs> That's all.
finished Bridge of Souls. It was really good. I really enjoyed it. It came out as a very high four star for me. Like if I was doing half stars, it would be like a 4.5, but I don't do 0.5s anymore. And I'm excited to start Chain of Iron. Also kind of nervous. I don't know how I'm going to feel about that. I just had such a good time with this story and I, I guess I had kind of forgotten how much I really love the characters in this story. Like Cassidy's parents, I really enjoy them. I think they have a really unique dynamic. I think they're both quite wise parents and you know they kind of say helpful things along the way without realizing that they're being helpful. And her mother is such an entertaining character because she's so like cheerful about murder, like she gets really excited about it. And then also obviously our main characters, Cassidy is just an absolute bean. She just like really loves her friends and her family and she wants to protect them and it's all very cute. And Lara is a character that she goes through so much growth in this series, I think. And I also, I just love her and we get to kind of see, I guess, a bit more of her backstory in this one. And then Jacob. Jacob is just my favourite character of the series. <laughs> like, I, I would die for him. I would die for him. So I really did enjoy the characters and how they all interact. I think their friendship dynamic, like the dynamic between Jacob and Lara is really fun. And then just like the three of them together is just absolutely adorable. So I gave it a nine for characters because I absolutely adore these characters. Atmosphere, I gave a nine as well. I think how she writes this story is absolutely incredible because it's easy to read because it's a middle grade but I think she does such a good job of creating very vivid descriptions of the places they are and you can feel like you're there and I think it's honestly some of the best descriptions and some of the best atmosphere of any of her books even though it is the middle grade series and it was actually genuinely creepy at times and I think the narrator of the audiobook really helped with this she did this absolutely terrifying voice for a, for a particular person in this book and I was like please stop obviously it wasn't completely terrifying because I'm an adult but like if I read this when I was actually like middle grade age I would have been absolutely terrified absolutely <laughs> and yeah I just really it did get actually quite dark at times and there is like a lot of discussions about death and stuff but it's definitely not like oh you should fear death it's very like death is all a part of like natural life and all that and how fear and all of that is all natural and you just have to kind of get on with it <laughs> obviously it's put a lot better then the writing I gave it a seven I do really like V Shaw's writing in all of her series but and I did enjoy it in this but I, w I was going to originally give it an 8 and then I dropped it down to a 7 because of all the Harry Potter references. So I just knocked one point off of it because it really got on my nerves in the end. I don't think there was as many references in this one as there has been in the previous two installments. And but there still was some. And I'm not like I know it was originally meant to come out in September last year. So like maybe it was written before all of that stuff. But I mean, it wasn't pr being printed yet, so there would have been enough time to change. I think I counted. I think there was five references, so it's not like too many, but like it's still five too many. <laughs> so I think that they're like, okay, she probably wrote it before all of that stuff happened, but it wasn't being printed yet. They could have gone back and edited them out, I think. So yeah, so I brought the writing down to one point, but the writing was really great in here. As I said, there was some humor to kind of balance out that darkness. There were some really nice quotes about, as I said, about fear and about death. So then plot, I gave a nine. I really enjoyed the plot of this one. Uh, just like the other ones, it is, it is quite a similar plot to all of them, but I think this one was definitely slightly different from the rest. And it was definitely, uh, I think the plot really was a good way to end this part of the series. I really do hope that she does come back and do more of them in the future, uh, but I think it was the way the plot went. Uh, it made a lot of sense to the story and I'm excited, hopefully, for there to be more someday. Then Intrigue, I gave an 8. <laughs> See, my, a slump isn't really the word because like I am reading and I mean I read it in two days, but I'm kind of like I don't want to pick up books 
but I'm like forcing myself and then when I'm picking up books I'm really enjoying them it's just for some reason I don't want to pick up books so I kind of had to mark it down for intrigue but that's literally just kind of more of a me problem than a book problem and like once I started listening to it I mean I did it in two sittings so like definitely it kept me interested and it kept me going and I was actually like genuinely afraid for some of these characters I was like it's a middle grade nothing bad can happen and then I was like Miss Schwab does not pull her punches will she do that in a middle grade? <laughs> I was really afraid for the consequences and I wanted to know how they were going to solve this mess they had gotten themselves into but yeah kind of more of a me problem there and then logic I gave an age I think I think the main problem with a lot of middle grades and it can also be a problem in way is there isn't logic like the, with the parents like how do they not re realize something is going on whereas with this one the parents do kind of realize something is going on but they don't know what it is <laughs> and so they're kind of and they're preoccupied with their show that they have filming and so it kind of makes sense that she is kind of getting away with these things because they're just like oh she's just being a bit of a wild child <laughs> and so it's still obviously not perfect there's always going to be a little bit of flaws in that kind of logic and that's why it's only an eight i do like how her there's consequences from her parents um like in the previous books you know she goes off she destroys property and they're like don't do that cassidy and lastly enjoyment i gave it a nine it wasn't perfect but i did have a really good time reading it and I would just absolutely die for these characters and like I was just like writing things down and like I can't even make sense of it I'm it's just like screams like at one point I just in capital letters like have found family and I'm, I was obviously very excited about there is a found family aspect in here so I was just obviously really excited about that which sounds about right um so yeah I definitely would recommend this series and this story even if you're not middle grade age because it's a story it's about fear and how you have to face that fear and that fear isn't going to go away just because you pretend it's not there and it's about family and friendship and it's about death and life and everything in between and it's about destiny and whether you can change it and all of that and yeah there are some really great moments in here um so yeah I really enjoyed it so that's kind of my spoiler free review of Bridge of Souls and I will I do have a couple of like spoilery things that I want to talk about but I will leave them far later and it's only like three things and it will be at the end of this video okay so I just started Chain of Iron and obviously no spoilers but I did just notice that there's grace chapters which pleases me <laughs> because I'm like one of few people in this world who are like grace blackthorn deserves better you can see she's clearly being manipulated by her mother and she's clearly in a bad situation and she and basically she has the same kind of backstory as every traumatized male character who everyone loves but because she's a woman and she's getting in the way of the main couple people are like she should have rotten hell and i'm like no and so I'm really hoping Cassandra Clare will do her justice. She's not my favourite character, but um, she is, I think, one of the most interesting characters in this entire story, as well as Lucy and Jesse. I'm really excited for their storyline in this, and it's honestly the only one I'm really excited for. I don't really care about Cordelia and James and their story. Um, and Matthew, I like all of the characters but I just don't really love them. Like I have a lot of previous characters in her stories. I do really like Christopher and Anna and what we've seen of them, but we haven't seen enough of them because there's so many characters. They weren't fully developed in the first book. And so I like what I've seen of them. And I think I could really love them if they get more page time. And same with Lucy and Jesse. I feel like they didn't get as much as Cordelia and James. And so I'm really hoping Lucy will get more in this one. So it's now Friday. I read about a third of Chain of Iron. I think it was actually 31% or something, but about a third of Chain of Iron yesterday. And I already know this is going to be a nightmare to read because the thing with Cassandra Clare books, for me anyway, I'm not sure it does everyone else feel is I find her writing is so easy to get into. 
you just fly through them. It's just really easy to read her writing because it's not super complicated and all of that. And that doesn't bother me. I don't like really flowery, fancy writing anyway. So like her writing, it does suit me or whatever. But it also makes it harder to rate it because I'm like, well, I flew through this. That must mean I really enjoyed it. And that's not always the case. And that was one of my issues with Chain of Gold last year. I was like, well, it has to be a five star because I read it so quickly, right? And I was like, no, I had a lot of issues with it. <laughs> I already have a couple issues with it. <laughs> Number one, usually I find the banter in her books. It's really good. And I'm constantly laughing and having a great time. And I just, I don't feel it as much in this book. I'm not really laughing as much. And I know they're, they're not comedies or anything, but like, that's something that, that I just enjoy is like the characters, how they bounce off each other and all of that. And I'm just not really getting it so far in this book. I have a couple of predictions about who is doing it, but there's two main ones, I think. And one of them, I'll be really mad if it's that person because it makes absolutely no sense. And then the other one, I'll be mad because it's way too obvious. There's two that I'm like, mm, I'm pretty sure it's one of them. My other issue is I'm, as I said, about a third of the way through the book and the plot hasn't even started yet. Like, it's only just started. I just felt like the opening of the book was just drawn out because there was an event that happened at the start of the book. Sandra Clare, like, pulled the most she could out of that. And it's like, okay, I've read about 200 and whatever pages. I could have read, I don't know, 100 and a bit. <laughs> so yeah, back to, like, my whole predictable thing. I think that's something that I need to just, I guess, yeah, get used to with Cassandra Clare books. I think I need to realise that... Her books are never going to be, I'm never, I don't think I'm ever going to get a new favourite from her. I think I've just kind of grown out of it, but at the same time, I'm always going to be able to fall into her books and have a good time. So that's kind of what makes it so complicated is I can just fall into books and have a really good time, but I don't think I'm ever going to get like a new absolute favourite book from her. I don't think anything will ever top the Infernal Devices from me and I think I need to stop trying to compare them all to that. I have changed as a reader. Like I used to be just 100% character and that's probably the reason why I like the Infernal Device so much is because it's so character driven. Whereas now I'm still like 75% character driven but I also like a bit of plot and I feel like Cassandra Clare's book they don't really have the best plots and so I think I need to just adjust my expectations to go in, have a good time, don't expect too much from it, don't expect a surprise ending because again that's a big problem I've been noticing with her books lately is the conflicts at the end. I don't like them. In Chain of Gold, the end conflict was so rushed and it was just, I mean, it was a 600 whatever page book and the conflict was about 20 pages and it was so anticlimactic. <laughs> that seems that I'm like hating this book, but I'm not. I'm really enjoying it. There's a particular point of view that I'm just absolutely adoring with every fibre of my being. I I'm not being dramatic. <laughs> Every time I read from this, it like actually like makes my heart sing. <laughs> and it's been very a very long time since I felt that way about characters and books. These characters and every time they're on the page together, I'm just like so happy. <laughs> and that's what makes it so hard because even though nothing like nothing plot wise is happening in their parts, just I adore them so much that their parts are like a five star. But then the rest of the parts are probably like a three star right now. <laughs> and so it's that's what make, is making it so hard to know what I feel about it. But hopefully the plot will pick up and I'll start to love some other characters a bit more. Anyway, that was a bit of a rant. So I'm now 40% in. So I've read another 10%-ish. And honestly, this whole 10% that I've read just now has been so repetitive. Like the same thing just keeps happening and happening and I'm getting kind of bored of it. Uh, so I'm really hoping that soon the plot quickens up. Please. <laughs> hey everyone, I'm now finished Chain of Iron. I actually finished it like two days ago. I ended up giving it a 4 out of 5 stars. It is kind of a lower 4 out of 5. I have like a full review basically because when I finished it I just like typed out all of my feelings <laughs> so maybe this might actually be number one easier for me to edit and number two more understandable <laughs> well, characters I gave an 8 out of 10 this book was actually pretty difficult to rate because 
for example, with characters, yes, it was an 8 out of 10, but some of the characters in here were like 10 out of 10, all-time favorite characters, while others were just like 6 or 7. So I kind of had to like average them. <laughs> I still haven't grown to adore a lot of the characters in this story. I do still absolutely love Lucy and Jesse. They are some of my new all-time favorite characters and I do really enjoy Grace's character. I don't agree with the stuff she does but I think she is an absolutely fascinating character and one of the most interesting characters uh, Cassandra Clare has written in recent years. Don't think that I hate the other characters. I do actually really enjoy them just not as much as I have previous characters. I did change my opinion on Alistair in this book. I didn't like him in the short stories, obviously, and I was kind of neutral on him in Chain of Gold. And then in this book, I did kind of turn to I do like him, but again, I still don't love him. The two characters that I do wish that we did get to see more of is Anna and Christopher, especially Christopher. Christopher does not get nearly enough time, I think. He's like, I think, probably the only character that doesn't get like a good amount of page time. And he is, he has the potential to be one of my favorite characters, but we're just not getting enough of him. But there is just so many characters that it is so difficult to try and develop them all. I do wish we had a bit more of Magnus because Magnus is such a big part in every single story. And I just don't think he's as present in the last hours as he has been in previous books. And also, where was Church? In the end of Chain of Gold, Magnus said, I need to send for my cat. And where was Church, guys? Yes, I am that upset about the cat being missing. I don't think Cassandra Clare has enough time to fully explore these characters, the friendships and the relationships between them, because we get glimpses and I love those glimpses, but I don't get enough. So then atmosphere, I gave a seven out of 10. Atmosphere and world building and all of that stuff, Cassandra Clare doesn't really have to do that anymore because we all, we're all familiar with it. I don't think this one transported me back in time as much as the Infernal Devices did. And I also didn't feel that sense of dread that I think she was trying to build up through like those serial killer chapters. In writing, I gave a 7 out of 10 as well. I don't think her writing is perfect, but I do think her writing has of course improved over time. Her writing is very easy to read and that's not necessarily a bad thing. I'm not the biggest fan of like super flowery writing style, so it suits me. It's very addictive and it just really sucks you into the story. It is quite addictive to read but I don't think this has as many quotable lines as like previous books and I don't think it has the same witty banter as a lot of her previous books have had as well. Plot I gave a 7. I actually almost gave this a 6 but then it was around the last 20 to 30 percent that really started to pick up so I bumped it up one but it was very close to getting a 6 because it was very boring and slow to start off with. The plot only started around one third of the way through and then even then it was quite repetitive then in the middle and then like the last 20-30% really picked up and got very interesting. And even when the plot did pick up I did find it was very like over the top dramatic. I find this with a lot of Cassandra Clare books now. She takes the same tropes and the same plot devices and all of that and she reuses them again and again and it kind of is starting to get on my nerves because it just feels like she's recycling old material. I guessed. There's kind of, I'd say, two big plot twists, and I guessed one of them very early on. Uh, I didn't get the other one, but I knew something fishy was going on. <laughs> Intrigue, I gave an 8 out of 10, because as I said, her writing is very addictive. It does draw you into this story. So yeah, I did enjoy it while I was picking it up, and I was more inclined to pick this up as I have been like last month, Logic I gave a 7 out of 10. I think the problem is with this book is the logic is quite low. Like I gave it a pretty high rating because she like tried to like get a lot of the adults out of the way like by sending them away or giving them a job to do and all of that. The Infernal Device characters they've been through this kind of thing. They they did all of this when they were teens and now their kids are teens and they seem completely oblivious to the fact that their kids are doing these things and I don't think that's very realistic so that does kind of like hinder my enjoyment a little bit because I'm like they would notice <laughs> and also I did find there was a couple of like very convenient things that happened in the book but wasn't too bad and then the last rating is enjoyment and I gave this an 8 out of 10 and kind of like characters there were some moments in this book that were 10 out of 10 and are some of my favorite scenes, not just in like the Shadowhunter world, 
in like any book ever but as I said the rest of it I was quite bored for so again that's like six or seven so I kind of again averaged it out to around an eight. So those are my non-spoilery opinions on Chain of Iron. Just a minute now I'm going to start on spoilers for Bridge of Souls and then I will go into Chain of Iron spoilers. So if you don't want to know about Bridge of Souls you can skip that and go to the Chain of Iron or if you don't want to know spoilers for either of them you can also just leave now. So if you're leaving now thank you for watching. Bridge of Souls spoilers starting now. <laughs> the bad guy in here the emissary I think is what he's called and the narrator the narrator is absolutely brilliant and they did the most creepy voice for that and it actually it like actually like creeped me out I was like please stop but I sometimes forget that Jacob is dead and then I remember and I get very sad about it we got Lara's backstory in this and it's like really heartbreaking like we already knew that there was kind of something fishy going on in her family situation but we got to see, I guess, how kind of neglectful her parents are and how Lara had her near-death experience where she was sick in hospital um, and in the end all she wanted was her parents to stay with her and they went out to like talk to the doctor and what, she just wanted one of them to stay with her and she, none of them did and it was just really sad because she just didn't want to be alone and I just really wanted to give her a hug. She's so precious. So yeah, and then I really enjoyed part five of the story and I do think this it did get quite dark because in part five they're at the Bridge of Souls and they all see how they nearly died slash died in a full circle moment and I did really enjoy it. In the end, and this is kind of the only major spoiler that I want to talk about, I'm very conflicted because on one hand I do wish Jacob had to like move on or something because throughout the whole series we've been seeing him getting stronger and we've been seeing Laura and Cassidy get really concerned about this and it was kind of building up and building up and then in the end he just like got weakened by fighting at the Bridge of Souls. I was really expecting him to like you know for him to like move on to get the emissary to go away or for him to become a bad spirit and for Laura and Cassidy to be forced to send him on or something and that didn't happen and as I said I'm not sure am I mad about it or not because I love Jacob and he's just absolutely precious and I didn't want anything bad to happen to him but also I feel like we were building up to something and we didn't get it. <gasps> so yeah that is a Bridge of Souls spoilers. Now on to Chain of Iron spoilers. So I actually have them color coordinated into four different colors. Purple is for Grace uh, Protection Squad. I'm not saying that I agree with the stuff she does like yes she's very manipulative and her putting that bracelet on James is not a good thing. I'm not saying that and I'm glad that James didn't like automatically forgive her or anything like that. Like he was rightly angry, even though I think he might have tad overreacted because he was like, you're more criminal. And I was like, dude, you're keeping secrets from the clave. Your wife is connected to Lilith now and your sister is trying necromancy. You can't talk about it. <laughs> from the first book, like, yeah, I didn't agree with what she was doing, but I was like, Grace is like basically every male character that everyone loves where she's in a difficult situation and I want to protect her from that. And because she's in the way of the main ship, everyone hates her. And I am not having that. And so I went through and with purple, I have about 20 quotes that prove that Grace just needs to be protected or she needs to be like towed off for what she did. But I have things that prove that this was never what she wanted and she was just afraid. For example, this is just one. If there was anything in the world that Tatiana Blackthorn loved, it was Jessie. With Grace, she could be critical and liberal with slaps and pinches, but she would never lift a hand to Jessie. Was it because he was a boy, Grace wondered? Or was it because he was Tatiana's child of blood? Well, Grace was only a ward she had taken in. And pink was for all of the cute Jessie and Lucy moments, which, if you've been wondering what scenes were like 10 out of 10, some new favourite scenes, so was chapter 7, where he is reading pieces from the beautiful Cordelia and then also chapter 9 which is where he convinces that he also loves her and they dance together and it's so cute. I am asking you command me to dance with you show me this waltz from Peru. Like that is that's one of my favorite scenes of this book the two of them just dancing outside in the snow and then when Jessie says to her Lucy you were wrong in what you said but only when you claimed you are not like Princess Lucinda not brave or resourceful or clever you are a thousand times better than those. You are better than any imagined heroine. You are my hero. They're so cute. I can't deal with them. And then the blue, 
again, this has nothing to do with the actual storyline. This is just cute moments with the Infernal Devices characters. One of James's middle names is Henry. Adorable. And then the yellow actually refers to the story. I guessed that it was Jesse's body being used to murder people pretty early on. Yeah, I was very proud of myself for guessing that, but I also thought it was quite obvious because she's done this before, because I literally, when Lucy said pretty early on in the book, she was like, oh, what if it's a demon or whatever possessing a shadow hunter? And they were like, no, we have protection spells put on us. I was like, hmm, what does this remind me of? Oh yeah, City of Fallen Angels, where Jace, because he died and came back to life, he didn't get the protection spells. And so he's vulnerable to being possessed. And I was like, hmm, who could be possessed, I wonder? And then I was like, hmm, Jesse. And I was like, if she is repeating this Jace storyline on Jesse again, I will be mad. And she was, and I was a little mad, but also I was kind of a little proud that I guessed it. One mistake I noticed was Grace, 1893 to 1896. And it says that Tatiana, she had taken the house from her brothers 25 years ago and now jealously guarded it. Which that's not true because this is like 1893 to 1896. So it was only about 14-ish years since she had taken it. Xanthus and Balios, those two horses, they're still alive. They must be getting near death. Unless like Shadowhunter horses live really long time because like they're like in their 20s at least. And I don't think horses live much longer than that. Um, but maybe Shadowhunter horses are different. I don't know the horse lore of the Shadowhunter world. Also, I was kind of mad that the Silent Brothers didn't notice that runes were missing. I'm like, that's pretty obvious. How did you not notice that? So, so I didn't call Lilith. And I think that's because in like whatever book, in like City of Fallen Angels, I'm pretty sure it said that it's been hundreds of years since she was on Earth. And 100 is not hundreds. I don't think I would have guessed it anyway, but still. I did definitely know something was fishy. I was like, I don't think that's Magnus. And I also was definitely like, Wayland and Smith think this does, thing does not make sense whatsoever. Christopher at one point says, Jack the Ripper took parts of the people he killed. And I would just like to say, does Cassie not remember that Jack the Ripper is not a he in this book? Jack the Ripper was actually a demon. And it was a child demon who was in Tales from the Shadowhunter Academy. The moment that, that confirmed it to me, Jesse's body that was doing the killings was when Lillian Highsmith, he did, she whispered, but he was dead, dead in his prime. His wife, she wept and wept. And I was like, hmm, that sounds like Rupert. Who looks like Rupert? <laughs> As I said earlier, I do think she reuses her plots a lot. So love triangles, she absolutely loves them. As I said, the whole Jace died and he didn't have protection spells and now Jesse he doesn't have protection spells and then also the whole fighting a prince of hell I mean that's been done in the red scrolls magic and it's been done in chain of gold and it's kind of been done in the last book of the white and then also Lilith that's been done before and then also like the whole necromancy thing that's been done the whole serial killer thing that's been done so that's kind of I think all I have to say really except I'm going to get into some theories. So I'm going to briefly talk about things that are I'm almost positive are going to happen in Chain of Thorns. So I think the family tree is pretty accurate and Cassandra Clare has just been telling us that it's wrong to A, retcon a couple of things and B, to try and, you know, throw us off and be like, oh, she said it's not true. So they mightn't end up together. I'm pretty sure the couples that end up together on that family tree are going to end up together. Christopher and Grace, Lucy and Jesse will end up together and I also think that Cordelia and James will end up together. I also think that Alistair and Thomas will both uh, survive this because so we don't actually get to see on the family tree who Thomas marries then it also implies that Alistair marries someone and his descendants lead to Emma Carstairs. That's not actually going to happen. So I think what's going to happen is him and Thomas are going to end up together and what I think is going to happen is I think Sana is going to die in childbirth and Alistair is going to raise that child as his son. And I think that basically the family tree got mixed up and instead of them seeing them as brothers, someone along the way messed it up and put him, uh, Alistair's brother as his son and him and Thomas are going to raise that child and then that leads to Emma Carstairs. I do think something is going to happen to one of the Fairchilds, I think. The only two characters that are truly safe are James and Lucy because she has referred to them living a lot of times like they're referred to in Ghosts of the Shadow Market in the 1940s when Tessa is a nurse in World War II. Also in the Clockwork Princess epilogue they are there at their father's death 
but I don't really trust that epilogue because Barbara was at Will's deathbed and guess who died in the first book which I'm so mad about that when I was rereading the Clockwork Princess uh before Chain of Gold came out I literally I took special care to see who was at Will's death and she took it back yeah Will's children their grandchildren their nieces and nephews so Cece's uh blue-eyed boys so I think Christopher's playing but we can't trust this epilogue can we and Gideon and Sophie's two girls two girls there are two girls I'm still mad about it and the Fairchild sons and daughters which they took back the whole daughter thing so she really doesn't care about continuity does she supposedly both Fairchild sons are there they maybe they both survived this so yeah, um, obviously we can't trust the epilogue, but we should be able to trust the epilogue. In A Deeper Love in the Ghost of the Shadow Market, uh, Katarina says, did you have a good visit this afternoon? And Tessa replies, the younger generation are still trying to talk to me, to talk me into leaving. They think I should go to New York. And then Katarina says, they're your children. They want what's best for you. That implies that her two children survive. But as I said, we can't trust Cassandra Clare because anything she says in books, she takes back but I think that's all of the spoilery things I want to talk about. I'll probably remember something when I'm editing this but it's fine. So that is all. Thank you guys so much for watching. I do hope you enjoyed. If you did, subscribe and I will see you all in the next one. Bye!